Welcome everyone to Ask Alan Anything. We've been doing this for, for about a month now, and every week there's just more and more to cover. This week is no exception. In the last seven days, we've had social unrest, which has dramatically changed the landscape for businesses. Lane and other Oregon counties have been approved to enter phase two reopening today. A new PPP bill was passed yesterday waiting for the president's signature. And yesterday I attended a, a presentation about attitudes of employees and the public about everything that's going on. Um, I like to think everyone thinks like me, but living in Eugene, I have found that no, that is uh, sadly not true. Of course, others around me say maybe that's a good thing, but there are three different, three different points of view about uh, willingness to engage in activities during the pandemic. And we will, we will discuss that. And of course, we have, we have questions. In fact, we have a stack of questions to go through. So, once again, welcome. I'm Oregon business attorney Alan Thayer. It's been my privilege to host these webinars. And today we have with, with us Brittany Quick Warner. Brittany is the president and CEO of the Eugene Chamber of Commerce. She stepped in actually during a difficult time and uh, for many of those who support the Eugene Chamber and has done actually a fantastic job. There have been a number of challenges in the three and a half years that, that she has been in this role and we have been glad that, that Brittany is representing us. I asked Brittany to join us today to, to speak about the social unrest, but specifically how businesses should be communicating with their employees, with their customers, and with the public. I think we've seen some examples in recent days of some terrible miscues by, by people sharing their thoughts. But you can't get away with just saying nothing either. Um, this is an issue that, that I think every business should address with their employees. So Brittany, thank you for joining us and would you please please uh, let us know what we should be doing. Thank you, Alan. I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, hi, everyone. Like Alan said, my name is Brittany Quick Warner. Um, I've been CEO for about three and a half years at the Chamber, and boy, it feels like it's been 15. <laughs> um, I feel like I've aged about 10 years just in the last three months. So um, I, I'm honored to be able to come on and, and chat with you all. And um, Alan, I'm constantly impressed by your knowledge and your investment and your commitment to this community. So um, regardless of, you know, if your opinions are the same as everybody else, I think there's room for all the opinions and I really appreciate it. Um, you know, I, I, Friday night was um, on social media watching live uh, on Facebook, the the protest that then um, we all kind of know turned into a riot in downtown Eugene. And I was just in total shock. I couldn't believe, um, I couldn't believe how quickly things escalated and the, the damage that was happening right there in front of all of our eyes. I, um, you know, I was even more devastated when I saw some of the black leaders who um, have done an amazing job to really bring people together to protest um, and to support the Black Lives Movement. I was just devastated to see that they were the ones having to beg people to stop vandalizing these properties. And I think that that's something that, um, you know, this conversation is complicated and it's uncomfortable, but we can't not have it just because it feels uncomfortable. Um, Saturday morning, I got up and I, um, you know, I went downtown and I walked around to the businesses that were impacted and, and to several dozen others downtown just to talk to them, to see how they were feeling, to see what was going on. Um, and I was, I was heartened that the businesses that I talked to, while they were 
rightly so, really angry about the um, the damage that was done. They were they were incredibly understanding of the movement, and I think that that speaks volumes to um, not only our um, our business community, but to our community in general. Is that you can have you can hold two things in your head at one time. You can be angry about the racism and the um, the systematic injustice in our country, and you can be angry that businesses were destroyed. Um, I think it's really important that we um, that we don't say that you have to be one or the other. Uh, obviously, property is nowhere close to as important as human lives, but these properties represent more than just the human lives. So, um, or these properties, excuse me, represent human lives as well. So, I think that it's. The chamber as an entity, we on Saturday, um, I got a call from Greg Evans, who's one of our local city councilors, and he said that he was trying to convene a handful of black leaders in our community and asked if they could do so at the chamber on Saturday night. So we opened up the chamber and I was, um, I was really honored to be able to sit in and listen to these incredible community leaders talk about, talk about the unrest, talk about their, you know, their anger and their, um, just their their sadness about what was happening in our community and across the country and I learned just in that hour sitting in that room with them so much more than I learned um, just about how our community is impacted by racism we came out with the NAACP uh, with a statement obviously condemning the um, the actions of the police officers who killed um, George Floyd but also condemning the violence uh, and the the rioting as well the chamber has, um, we've put out three different statements this week um, and each of them is progressively different. And I think that that's super important as a business to recognize is that it's not like this thing where you can just put one statement out there and say, okay, I did my thing. This is so much more than just lip service. Like we really, as a community and as a business community, we've got to figure out how we can be a part of um, of moving our community forward and and, and trying to fight some of this injustice. So um, I will say every statement that I've put out there, I've learned something new from, right? People are really sensitive right now. And um, some people appreciated them, some people didn't. Some people had specific pieces that they disagreed with, but everyone who's reached back out to me and given their feedback has been really respectful and I've learned and I've listened. And so I think that's the most important thing right now is we have to be willing to set aside our preconceived notions and just listen to what people are saying um, and to give each other a hell of a lot of grace right now because we're none of us are going to respond to this perfectly. So is it fair to say that we should draw a distinction between social injustice and damage and destruction? I think that this is complicated and this is really what I've kind of struggled with this week because there is there's a lot of conversation and and a lot of communities who are dealing with some of the violence and the um, destruction that's coming from these riots, um, they are, they're all very different, right? And Eugene, if you go back and watch the videos, um, like I said, the, the leaders of the Black protest um, on this last Sunday were there on Friday night and they were leading a peaceful protest and then it obviously became um, destructive and they were the ones begging people to stop. And so in our community, it did feel like this was not the, you know, the leadership of the Black Lives Matter movement who was instigating this crime. In other communities, that might be different. There, you know, folks talk a lot about how, um, how people's anger is just disorienting them and they're committing crimes because of it. Because of it. I don't think that we should. Um, I don't think that we should just accept that or justify it in any way. But I do think that we have to understand it um, and know that that our our country has um, turned a cheek to the peaceful protest and not done anything in response to those. And so, you know, while I wouldn't do the same myself people, they're turning to destruction because they don't know what else to do. Um, so by no means do I think that that justifies it, but it's, it's just complicated. It's not as easy as I thought it was to just say the destruction is bad, the protesting is good. 
I suspect that this is going to be an issue that's going to be with us for a while. And we appreciate everything that you and the chamber are doing. And as, as you have thoughts on how we can, we as business people can communicate with our stakeholders, our employees, our, our customers, uh, your thoughts would be very much appreciated. If, yeah. if you'd be willing to stay on the webinar, uh, people can ask questions. I ask that you ask questions through the Q&A feature, not through the chat feature. And um, please ask questions of Brittany and we will, we will ask her for her assistance. Yeah, I the, will, Alan, if you, if you don't mind, I guess I just added another thing. So I think it's important to really try to provide people with tangible ways that they can, um, that they can be supportive in this time. And for me, one of the first things was sitting down and talking to my staff um, via Zoom, because we're all working remotely, um, but we just kind of opened up a conversation on Tuesday and I just said, how are you feeling? And just letting them kind of express how they're thinking and feeling, I think is one of the first things that as an employer you can do to be supportive. Um, then the other thing that we're doing, which is so small, but it felt like something that we could actually do, um, is that I told all my staff to pick a book um, that, you know, there's lots of really great reading lists that are being published right now around social injustice and racial injustice. I said, pick a book that you want to learn something about this issue. The chamber will pay for that book, right? It's, you know, I have 10 staff, so it's not like a, a, an expense that I think is not worth it. And we're going to read together and learn and try it and then bring, come back together to discuss. So it's things like that, that there are actual tangible things that employers can be doing. That, those are great suggestions. Thank you. And once again, use the Q&A function to ask questions of Brittany as we all try to navigate this, this current social justice environment. So when, uh, when we plan these weekly webinars, we, we think we know what we're going to be talking about and then other things, other things can come up. But the primary purpose of this webinar is to discuss reopening without liability. And I am going to uh, share my screen here with everyone. Please, please uh, forgive me while I go through this. And you, you should, uh, should see my web browser. And I want to, I want to start with a, a resource by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, and it's called Reopening Business. The U.S. Chamber um, has a few more resources than the Eugene Chamber, but the, the U.S. Chamber and their staff have been doing a tremendous job of, of putting together materials to help business while at the same time advocating for business and business issues through all of this. There, so the question is, will businesses be sued? I mean, I think people can uh, envision a few months from now that there will be uh, TV ads. Uh, do you want to sue your employer? Do you want to sue, uh, sue a business? Do you think someone gave COVID? Call 1-800-GOT-COVID. Uh, and um, soliciting lawsuits. And indemnity for businesses has been an issue for both the U.S. Chamber at a federal level and for the state of Oregon for Oregon business and industry. And hopefully those, those indemnity efforts will, will uh, come to some sort of fruition. However, th those are controversial. We have heard Democratic leaders in the state of Oregon say, well, yeah, we, maybe we ought to do some sort of indemnity, but we don't want to give too much indemnity, whatever, whatever that means. So that, that makes us a little concerned whether, whether there will be any protections for businesses who are reopening. But let's assume for a moment that there, the law stays the same. There is no specific indemnity protections for business. 
except in, in um, really specific circumstances, there generally is not what's called strict liability. You're not, you're not liable because something happened. Instead, if a person wants to hold you liable for some event, they have to prove that you did something wrong. And in the negligence area, the analysis is what was the standard of care that the business or person should have followed and was that standard of care met? That standard of care is generally determined by what is common in the industry or community with which the person who's being sued, the defendant, operates. But in this instance, we don't have years of history of, of industry practice with which, to, uh, with which to judge. So instead, the standard of care is going to be determined by looking, looking at state, federal, industry, and in some instances, local, although uh, it hasn't been an issue in Oregon yet, uh, local guidelines. And there are a number of guidelines published and that is, that's, we're going to look, look through that today, and I'm going to show you where you can find these, these guidelines. Uh, if, you, if you were to look at the news on the Lane County's reopening for phase two, it's, um, it's a, a short article, and it explains a little bit about what's expected for phase two but it is not inclusive and hopefully your inquiry will, will extend beyond just news articles. Although I've got to say that our local media has been doing a great job of, of covering these stories. The stories are, or the information that you need is just way too large to be covered in a TV, TV story. I did receive a copy. Of the governor's letter to Lane County, allowing Lane County to to open, uh, I actually received this letter just uh, shortly after the the county received it. Uh, and I, I want to point out something here that I think we we may discuss later. But they they talk about phase two, and and of course, once you're in phase two, you want to think about okay when do we get phase three and, and what constitutes phase three in this community being a college town resumption of sports is, is uh, something that is very, people are very interested in, but it's, it's a little concerning. If you look at the paragraph that uh, I think my, if you can see my cursor here, oh, I can highlight this. Phase two is the last full phase until there's a widely available treatment of a vaccine for COVID-19. So as we open our businesses or continue doing business, we have to follow all of the, the phase two guidances that we're going to discuss. And you're going to have to follow the phase one guidances as appropriate, uh, probably for some time until there is a widely available treatment or vaccine. Um, Lane County had, had requested greater flexibility in determining what works and what does not work in Lane County. The governor in this letter said she's interested in talking to, to Lane County and getting their feedback, but does not promise the county the flexibility that the county had had requested. So we talked about the standard of care and the first place we need to go to look are the Oregon guidance. Uh, guidance. Now this website is govstatus.egov.com. Don't worry, we will email all of these links to you at, probably later today. Um, but this is a site that was set up to, to provide information to the public about uh, the governor's 
orders and the guidances, guidances issued by the state. So there's a description here of what constitutes phase one, phase two, and phase three. Phase three are mass gatherings such as concerts or sporting events with live audiences. And that, that's something, although it's important to this area, it sounds like it's something that we won't see for a while. But what I wanna specifically draw your attention to are, are the various guidances issued by the state, and there's now quite a few of them. And if you're a restaurant or bar, certain provisions apply to you. If you're a, a hairdresser, then the personal service provider guidance applies. Shopping centers and malls, gyms. Um, there are a number of different, different guidances. And as you're trying to figure out what you can and can't do in your business, and how, how you can develop policies to, to protect you from potential liability, I would uh, commend this site to you and uh, go, through, go through the various guidances. There are a couple questions coming up and we are going to uh, use the guidances to answer those questions. So you'll see a little more about, about what I am talking about. So that's at, that's at the state level. What's happening at the federal level? Well, that's where information put together by the, the U.S. Chamber can be of a big help. So you will, you will receive a link to this, to this page for the U.S. Chamber, but there's a couple things here that I wanna draw to your attention. First, state-by-state -state business reopening guidance. This is, um, um, this is 20,000 foot level information. So if you operate in other states, you can get some information on, on what's going on in those states, but you may have to drill down further with guidance, guidance is published by those states. But if you look at Oregon, um, well, looks like uh, this needs to be updated. Um, uh, it's dated May 15th, phase one reopening, but there is, there is discussion of the Oregon requirements. And actually I read through these and, and it's, it's a very good summary, but it is a summary nevertheless. Um, not too sure. Well, I seem to have lost where I was. Uh... There we go. Now we're back to where I wanted to be. So um, the state-by-state -state guidance, that's, that's helpful. There are sector-specific guidances, and I talked about liability and the standard of care being based upon state, federal, and industry-specific standards. And, and this, is a, uh, this is one place to go to get um, industry specific standards. Uh, everyone should, oh, by the way, uh, you have access to the U.S. Chamber website, whether you are a member of the U.S. Chamber or not. And you can download these resources from, from the U.S. Chamber. Uh, one of the things that I commend to you, though, is they're ready to open a playbook for your small business. It is, um, it is short, but it has a, a number of excellent, excellent suggestions on reopening your business. And we talk about reopening. A lot of businesses have been opened at, at some, to some degree. Um, if, if you haven't been ad adopting these practices, now is the time to make changes and, and to, do, to do that very thing. But take a look at a playbook for your small business. Uh, there's um, uh, Co. by the U.S. Chamber 
is a new resource developed by the chamber, but there are some practical communications type suggestions here. And I would encourage you to take a look at that as well. But what I am looking for here is standardized employee screening questionnaire. There are questions that you should be asking employees as they uh, return to work or as they come to work. And generally, these are the types of questions that you don't ask because of other employment laws, but the EEOC, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, has come out with a, with a guidance that says, no, in this, this pandemic time, you can ask certain questions of your employees. So, for example, uh, the, the chamber recommends asking every day, have you had a fever, cough, shortness of breath, um, a, a list of symptoms uh, within the last two to 14 days. You can ask these questions and you should ask these, these questions. So please take a look at the, the screening questionnaire. And there are other resources here. Um, workplace flyers and posters and, and other resources for you and your business. So I would encourage you to take a look at, at what has been created by the, the U.S. Chamber of Business. There is another organization with whom I want to call your attention, and that is the National Safety Council. And the National Safety Council has has been looking at, at what businesses can do to keep their employees safe and to keep the public safe and has developed playbooks for different businesses and in different industries. And uh, here you will see a link to their, their safer playbooks. Now, they've organized their materials in an interesting way. They have they've broken it down into six different topic areas, physical, medical, mental, uh, legal, communication, and external factors. And, but recognize that these, that these topics are handled differently depending upon the type of business that, that, that you are in. Um, and so, I have an office. And so we can look at their return to work guidance for office operations. The National Safety Council has, has spent a lot of work and uh, talking to a lot of businesses and in determining what are the guidelines that businesses in these areas should be, be following. So this is just one example. It is, it is something that I would encourage each and every person uh, who runs a business to go through and use these guides to help guide you on what, what you are going to do in your business. Now, there, there is talk, of, I mean, there's been a lot of discussion about personal protective equipment and whether you need to have face mask in your office. As we've talked about before in prior in prior uh, webinars, there is a difference between respirators, face masks, and face coverings. So a face covering would be a cloth or fabric covering over your face. And do not say face mask if what you're referring to are face coverings. Uh, everyone seems to be, be uh, uh, combining those two, but they are not. My concern is, is that if you say that face masks are required, but you allow face coverings, that you could be opening yourself up to future litigation. It's really easy. Instead of saying face masks, say face coverings, and, and that includes masks. But in some instances, Greater protection is required. Face masks may be required or, 
respirators require may be required. By the way, what you've heard is an N95 face mask. That's actually a respirator. Um, but if face mask or respirators are being used, it is important that they be used correctly. 3M has put together a, a resource on worker health and, and safety. 3M manufactures a lot of personal protective equipment and they have, they have information here about using the equipment correctly. I attended a presentation by 3M and masks have to fit very, very tight across the face and have to be fitted very carefully. And in fact, workers with um, need to be, uh, male workers need to be clean shaven when wearing these masks in order for them to fit properly and seal across the face. They've said that uh, more than a day's worth of growth on beard or under the nose can interfere with the fit of the face mask and um, interfere with the, with the effectiveness of that personal protective equipment. So if you are required to have PPE, personal protective equipment, I would encourage you to go to the 3M link that we're going to share with you and to, to drill down about the, the proper use of this equipment and train your employees accordingly. I'm going to go back, uh, go, go back to the U.S. Chamber for a moment. I, um, I am a member of a U.S. Chamber Return to Work Task Force, and we had a presentation yesterday by a pollster who talked about attitudes. And they survey, they have been surveying, I think every week, um, members of the public and employees about their attitudes about returning to work and engaging in various activities. And in their studies, they, they've, broken, they've broken people down into three groups. One is the ready to go group. They are, they are ready to resume most activities. Then there are the assurance seekers. They are willing to resume specific activities with assurances that it is safe to do so. And then there are the need medical breakthrough group. They're not comfortable resuming activities unless an approved COVID-19 vaccine or a medically proven protocol to mitigate and remedy effects of the virus is found. You have within your employees, employees who are ready to go, employees who are ready to go, but, but they need assurance and people who don't want to uh, leave their house until there is a medical breakthrough. So three different activities were shared with us or the polling information on three different activities were shared with us. And one is attending a, a conference or a convention. A, another is going to a hotel or resort. And the third was going to a retail store. And the ready to go group 48% were ready to go to a uh, convention or conference, 52% were ready to go to a hotel, and 74% were ready to go to a retail store. On the assurance seekers, 21%, well, they range from 21% uh, to 12%, and that is, is that I, I'm uh, phrasing this in a way that's maybe a little difficult, but of the assurance seekers, 12, 21% they would need assurances before they would go to a conference or convention. For a retail store, only 12% said that they need, that they need um, assurances that it is safe to go to a retail store. The medical breakthrough group, 31%, would require a conference or a convention, uh, medical breakthrough before they would attend a conference or a convention, but only 14% say they would require a medical breakthrough for, for 
going to a retail store. This is important that if you want employees to return to work and feel safe and comfortable returning to work, and if you want customers to feel safe and comfortable uh, doing business with your organization, you need to address the assurance seekers. You need to let them know what you are doing, how you are, are complying with, with uh, requirements for enforcing their safety. Better yet, you may even want to say that you are exceeding the recommendations. And, and uh, um, if you say you're exceeding the recommendations, then you actually need to do what, what you say you're going to do. Um, even those that say that they're ready to go, there is still some hesitation. Uh, misinformation, lack of information, conflicting guidance. Uh, a lot of those in the ready to go category don't have a lot of confidence in what's being reported and what's being said to them. They say it's all ad hoc and confusing. Um, I, I tend to agree with them, but maybe I'm in the ready to go category. Um, but having sat out for a couple of months now, they don't want their effort to be for nothing. They don't want to have sat at home or worked from home or put up with, with the other disruptions in their life just to turn around and have everything fire back up again. And of course, those in the ready to go category are concerned about others who are in the high risk group, including uh, friends or family members of theirs. The assurance seekers, um, there's, they want to see customers, customer facing staff, your employees wearing face masks. They want uh, seating at your offices to be reconfigured to accommodate social distancing. And they want prominent listings of the sanitation practices that are to be implemented by each of your locations. As we try to interpret employee action, employee concerns, in some instances, employees reluctant to return to the workplace, keep in mind these three different categories. And, and hopefully that will, that will help with that. Um, one of the requirements in Oregon, it was a phase one requirement for those businesses that continued to uh, operate in some capacity. And it is a requirement for a, a part of phase two reopening in Oregon is to designate a person to implement in, to develop, implement, and enforce your safety protocols. So you should do that. You need to communicate your protocols with your, with your employees. A lot of businesses are doing, doing training sessions with their workforce, some of them in person, some of them, them um, online. But develop develop your protocols, communicate your protocols, and then do what you say you're going to do. You as the business leaders need to set a good example. If face masks are required for, for your business, then, then you too should be wearing a face mask when you are out among others. And I said face mask when probably uh, maybe referring to a face covering instead. And then, then enforce your, your policies. If you see employees failing to social distance, then you need to enforce your policies. And you can decide what you want to do for enforcement, but if your enforcement isn't working, then you may very well need to, to step that up. Hopefully this makes sense, and hopefully this is helpful. Um, I, what I'd like to do now is to go through some very, very specific questions that have been asked. There was, uh, there's an Oregon business 
that talked about employees and their social distancing policies and that they they told their employees they need to social distance and they set up the workspace so that they can social distance but they're frustrated that the employees then gather on their own during breaks and don't maintain social distancing you need to talk to your employees about this this employer um, had ended up having three employees test positive for COVID-19. But they said something interesting. First of all, they were very frustrated that that happened. But they said something interesting. They said that the way the, the positive tests are counted, that not only were there three employees counted as, as um, positive COVID cases, but the other members of those employees' households also were counted as, as having tested positive, even though no tests were performed and they may not have even had any symptoms. According to this, to this uh, Oregon business, their, in, their three employees added a total of eight people to the Oregon count. Now, I have, I have asked questions of some folks uh, who should be in the know to determine if that is, is in fact the way Oregon is counting positive tests, and we hope to get more information on that. When the, or if and when the Oregon legislature meets in a special session, one of the things that they're going to discuss, we are told, is, is a workers' comp presumption. That is, if a if one of your employees uh, tests positive for COVID nineteen, it will be presumed that they contacted uh, the virus at your workplace and then be covered by workers' compensation. The the, um, the boundaries of that presumption have yet to be determined. They're they're. They're being discussed now. And as you can imagine, between, between some of the proponents of this presumption and the business community at the moment, there is a wide, wide different, differentiation. Last week, met, in, met uh, through a video conference with Tina Kotek, who is the speaker of the Oregon House. And she was, I mean, she was quite interested in this uh, OSHA uh, presumption, and I think uh, she's at a place right now where a lot of a lot of businesses are not, and we will see how how that comes comes to pass. Uh, face coverings that was an issue that was very important to her. She complained that she had gone to the grocery store over the weekend and at least a third of the people in the, the grocery store weren't wearing face coverings. Um, I, I suspect that would, uh, that would put the speaker in the assurance seeker category. And I wouldn't be surprised if the Oregon legislature discusses some sort of requirement that We've, we've seen in some other states that if you leave your house, you must have a face covering on your face. Hopefully that won't, won't come to, uh, to pass. That is not what the, the current guidance is issued by the state of Oregon require, but that would be something to watch. Uh, there was discussion of the event industry, and, and this was really interesting. She said uh, that, well, they, they can't open, but we're working on getting a pot of money for them. And was talking about how what the state needs to do is to find ways to to get money to so industries that they select. Uh, that that is is concerning. Um, she but she said they are struggling to get more money quickly. Um, not working with businesses to figure out how they can uh, reopen, but instead let's just let's just distribute business. Okay, at at every one of these webinars so far, we have had a PPP loan question 
And uh, that is, that's true today. Carol asked, we were awarded a PPP loan for, but one of our employees has decided not to return to work. We, we had him sign a form that said he was offered his job back, but declined. Will this affect our loan status? So as we've talked about with the PPP, one of the frustrations is, is that the rules are constantly changing. Uh, sometimes they change for the better and sometimes they change for the worse. But with employees returning to work, there, there are two components. Number one is you have to have employees return in order to be eligible for loan forgiveness. And then two, the amount of money that would be subject to loan forgiveness depends uh, to a large part, so at least 75% on the money paid to employees that return. And uh, the, the laws that stands right now, that money it has to be spent within eight weeks from the date that the PPP funds land in the business's account, bank account. Well, there, um, a bill was, was passed by the, the U.S. House, I believe last week, was passed by the U.S. Senate yesterday and is waiting for the governor, or excuse me, the, the president's signature that would extend the PPP loan forgiveness timelines. So as to the part of the question about money that would have gone to this employee uh, being used for a forgivable purpose if the employee does not return to work with the, the extension in time, uh, that issue ought to be resolved. But the, the threshold question of having the same number of employees at the, the beginning of the look back period versus at the relevant date, whatever date that is, it was eight weeks, but that date is changing. Um, a form that said he was offered his job but declined. At, uh, at this point, there are guidances that say, yes, that is acceptable. We had, um, we had a question about the Oregon minimum wage that's due to increase, I believe, uh, 75 cents an hour on July 1st, which is coming right up. And would the state be willing to, to look at postponing that increase at this time? I actually asked that very specific question of the, the Speaker of the Oregon House, and it was clear she was not interested in under any circumstances. So that looks like that is not going to go anywhere. In fact, that seems to be such a dead issue that even um, um, business lobby associations aren't even asking that the state do that. Some trade associations I believe are, but others are, are trying to focus on other areas and just assuming that, that the minimum wage increase will, a uh, minimum wage will increase by 75 cents an hour on, on July 1st. So I guess we need to, we need to prepare to, to do the same. So we, um, a church has asked, our church is about 400 people and we have a smaller building. We are going to do three services with signups. Our capacity is 300 people, but it can only fit 220 chairs. So we are trying to figure out how many people we can do per service. On phase two for churches, the governor's site says indoor and outdoor venues, including theaters and churches with six feet, of physical distancing and other measures in place can reach a COVID-19 occupancy limit of up to 250 people. That is true, but in order to get to 250 people, there needs to be 35 square feet per person. So you would need to have a very big space in order to hold uh, 250 people. Let's go back to our resources for Oregon and go down to the phase two guidance, I believe. Uh, well, once again, go back to the phase two guidance and go to gatherings, general guidance. 
And the, the general guidance is a maximum of 50 people indoors, 100 people outdoors. But there are some exceptions. Indoor and outdoor entertainment facilities, does that include a church? Uh, I don't know. But if it does, um, it requires the square footage occupancy uh, provisions as set out below. And I believe somewhere in here, it's going to require 35 square feet per person up to 250 people total. Uh, also is asked, can a family from the same household sit together without social distancing? So I, I think the question is, is, is it six feet social distancing per person or six feet social distancing per family or, or uh, living group? And the answer is the latter. So um, you can have families sit together and, and they can sit together. You just need to have a way to make sure that in, in, in front of them and behind them and on either side of them, there is six feet distance between the next group of, of people. Also for children, uh, there's no way they will social distance. If the parents are okay with that and we take as many precautions as we, we can do, uh, as we can, do you see any concerns or any recommendations? We're thinking of having our kids also outdoors. Um, no, this is, uh, this is an area where I'd be really, really, really cautious and I think you are opening yourself up to liability risk and um, probably um, a PR backlash if, uh, if, if you don't follow the rules and particularly if, if uh, it is determined that the coronavirus was passed from one group to another at, at, your, at your church, which can certainly happen when you have children from one household playing with children from another. They may not, they may not uh, uh, come down with the symptoms that they could be a carrier. And I don't think it makes any difference what you have, uh, what you have the parents sign either. So then I was asked a question about, um, about a, a church youth group and say it's impossible to keep teenagers social distancing. Well, as the father of a teenage daughter, I kind of like the idea of social distancing, but in response to this question, um, if you're going to have a youth group, you need to enforce the rules. If you're going to have church service, you're going to need to enforce the rules. If you are a, a uh, business, you need to enforce the rules. Um, I want to thank everyone for their questions. Uh, actually, I, if, uh, if Brittany is uh, available, Brittany, uh, do you have anything that you would like to add to the discussion that, that we just had on reopening without liability? Yeah, I mean, I want to kind of reiterate what, what Alan said in the beginning that we're grateful to have partners like the U.S. Chamber and other national organizations that do have a lot more resources than we do to, to really dig in um, around some of the legal issues. But we are trying to do everything we can to lend our voice um, and our advocacy to you know the state level um, to really try and address some of these liability concerns that businesses are raising. So I appreciate your work on that, Alan. Um, you know, we are... Uh, doing everything we can to continue to educate businesses. I know it's incredibly complicated <laughs> and um, there's a lot of uncertainty, but if, if folks have questions, please feel free to reach out and we have folks who will, we don't know the answer that we'll, we'll do the digging for you maybe so you don't have to spend as much time doing that. So just appreciate, appreciate your uh, education here, Alan. Well, uh, the point is, is that there are resources available for businesses as they sort through these issues. They are, these are difficult issues. If you haven't, if you uh, look at these resources and find out that, that you've been doing something wrong, well, now is the time to adopt the, the new policies. And I know that Brittany and her staff are, are available to help. 
we're available to help. Um, we, we want businesses to reopen and for the economy to reopen and for Oregon to get back to whatever normal will be without lawsuits. Um, and one of the ways that you protect yourself is by saying we followed the standards set out by the state of Oregon. We followed the standards recommended by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. We followed the standards recommended by the National Safety Council. And that will, that will go a long ways towards helping you return to business um, as safely as possible from a legal viability standpoint. Thank you, everyone. We appreciate your joining us and look forward to your joining us in the future.